Thanks for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn. Uh, we're going to be spotlighting Sugar Serve. I'm really excited about it. Um, my name is Frank Cuccio. I'm the Customer Success Manager at BrainCell, and I'll be the host for today's event. Um, before we jump in, I want to cover a couple of housekeeping items. Now, this is going to be a 45-minute presentation uh, with about 15 minutes of Q&A at the end. And you can type in your questions in the box below and you know, submit them throughout the presentation. And uh, my colleague Caitlin will be you know, fielding some of these and uh, passing them along to us. Uh, also, we'll be sending a copy of the slide deck and a recording of the webinar uh, at the end. Uh, right now, Caitlin's going to be launching a poll. Uh, so just select wherever you'd like your food delivery for the lunch. Uh, to come from. Y'all are putting the lunch in lunch and learn. Yeah, it's got to do it nowadays virtually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Charles Hicks. He's the uh, General Manager of Customer Service over at Sugar. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Frank. And uh, we'll just get into our agenda for today. Um, we're going to do some, uh, some Q&A with Charles, plus a look at Sugar Serve in action, a little bit of audience discussion, and we'll wrap up. Um, and we want this to be uh, very interactive. So if you have any questions, feel free to chime in. Um, yeah, so before we jump into the discussion on Sugar Serve, we do a little icebreaker with our guests. So Charles, if uh, you could keep only three apps on your phone, what would they be? Well, it's a good question because I only have three apps on my phone. I'm, <laughs> for, a, for a tech guy, I'm like the most pen and paper person in the world. <laughs> um, for me, it's real simple. I listen to music on my phone. That's like an absolute necessity in the car, on the road, wherever I'm going. Uh, Got to have my camera. And then uh, the, you know, the third one I was thinking about was uh, was DoorDash because there's just a certain certain in in today's day and age, uh, it might be easier to order food online through your phone than to actually go out and like have a pizza delivered or something like that. So I was thinking, I was like, yeah, that's that's a that's a pretty cool. Yeah. It's pretty nice on a Sunday afternoon sitting on the exactly. couch watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have to talk to anybody. I save all my phone calls for Monday through Friday. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, no groundbreaking secrets there, but uh, hopefully it tells you how boring of a person I am. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, so we can get started. So yeah, I read a stat the other day that, you know, 50% of customers think that, you know, customer service is more important now than it was a year ago. Uh, maybe that's something to do with the pandemic, maybe not, but you know, what do you, why do you think that is? <laughs> it's a, that's a, that's a great question. So I think that, um, Customer experiences in general, like the bar for customer experience uh, over the last five to 10 years has gone up considerably. And, and I blame I blame Jeff Bezos, right? Like I blame Amazon. Um, I was reading an article the other day with this, this guy was talking about what life was like in the early 2000s. And he was talking about how um, he rarely got what he wanted and uh, and it never arrived on time. Right. <laughs> right. And I think nowadays that's been flipped on its head. Um, most consumers expect to get what they're looking for uh, quickly and with very low friction on their terms. And that's spilled over into the business world as well, right? I mean, consumer expectations in a large way uh, are leading the charge uh, of, of, of customer experience 
projects at B2B companies as well as B2B as well as B2C companies. And so I think there's the consumer angle, but then there, there's some real data, um, there's some real business value to um, focusing on your customer experience as a business. Um, I'm sure we'll get into this, but but it's like companies that have good customer experience, they just outperform those that don't. And it's and, and the and, and you kind of ask yourself why. It's real simple. They've thought through the process that their customer goes through and where they can add value or reduce friction or do the you know do the necessary things to just make it a really seamless experience. And I think um, just to talk to the one point on this slide, retention, right? And I think as a salesperson who's you know who's who's trying to manage the customer experience with your own customers um having a view of what's happened and when and and where the friction points are just just allows you to get your arms around um how you know how you can improve the customer experience or or shepherd that customer further down the road to the next point of success um and I think you know just just a couple stats here. Uh, I'm I'm not going to go I'm not going to go into them. I'll you know I'll I'll let y'all read them. But but three dimensions of of improvement areas on your business um, that ultimately result in in your company retaining more money and being able to sell more to your customers. And it it re it really just comes it really just comes down to thinking through those processes and how you know what the customer is feeling at each of those points. Very nice. You know, we hear a lot about, you know, alignment and misalignment between sales and service organizations within a company. Um, you know, we think it's really important that these teams are aligned. In fact, at Brain Cell, we actually have meetings that we call smarketing meetings, and we call the, the sales and marketing teams are the, the smarketing. So, you know, we, we do see the value in making sure that everybody's kind of walking in lockstep you know what do you see as some common issues that prevent that in maybe some customers or organizations you've been a part of yeah that's a that's a great question i think um i, I think it's interesting it's it's interesting because both groups are trying to do the right thing right sales people are uh i've i have never met a salesperson that that feels like a malicious towards their customers they're you know they 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 love their customers they want them to be successful and they want them to be happy and the service teams are the same way i mean they and you know they love providing good customer service and fixing the problem what's so interesting though is how often they operate in vacuums by themselves and and it's a testament to the fact that we've built systems and departments and organizations that are focused on sales and service but from a customer perspective, you're looking at the experience across the entire organization. You don't care if you're talking to a salesperson or a service person. You just want your problem fixed, right? right. And so, and and this is where CX gets difficult because uh, you have to shift from the vertical orientation to the horizontal orientation, for uh, you know, from your customer's perspective. And I think a good way to do that is is to just ask a couple of key questions, and and they're you know they're written here right here on the slide. And they're by no means uh, the complete list of questions, but I think they will get your teams thinking internally about the horizontal aspect of the customer experience. So things like how you know how customers get handed off from marketing to sales to service, how you keep your customers in the loop about um, updates or news or things that might be important to uh, to you know to them. So this could be like a product update or a service update, or it could be that you know you've resolved a long-standing issue. And you want everybody to, uh, you know, to uh, come and take a look at it, right? Um, and you know, and then last but not least, just, you know, just how you support your customer through processes that, like, maybe are a little bit of uh, the white space or the gray area inside of your business. You know, I always say that customer experience happens in the margins, right, between yeah. the departments. And and a great, you know, a great example of this is if you're a software company and you have a free trial process. What happens if a prospect hits an issue with your product during the free trial process? Like he's not, you know, they're not a paying customer. Right. How are you going to service them? Right? <laughs> Most companies don't have great answers to, you know, to those questions. And so I think if you just ask yourself those questions, it becomes really clear where you might just be uh, leaving money on the table or, you know, or, or, or letting potential customers, good potential customers fall, you know, uh, fall through the cracks and have a bad experience. Uh -huh. I've been part of an or organizations too and seen them even customer bases 
where, you know, sales, they're the champions because they're bringing in money. Customer service, yeah, it's a necessary thing, but they're not bringing in money. They're, they're costing you money. Yeah. That's at least how some people think of that. I think we'll get into that a little bit more, but. Well, it, that's a that's a good point. I think um, customer service is seen as a cost center uh, traditionally, and what we've seen in some of our more progressive uh, customers at Sugar is that they really are uh, taking they really are turning service into a revenue center, and but they're not doing it in a salesy way, right? right. And, and yeah, so that's a that's a really good that's a good seed to plant with the audience because I think um, keep your keep your eyes and ears open for how we can turn service into revenue through, you know, through these combined processes. Cool. So what do you think are the top challenges, you know, between the two groups um, and their alignment? Now, can you walk us through that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I think of, um, I think of it from a couple of angles, right? Um, you know, I think we're going to look at this through five different, uh, you know, five different lenses. Uh, the first one is is that, you know, both teams need to understand how they contribute to the customer experience, and they need to know how um, how they hand off, to, you know, how they pass the baton, and uh, where they need to engage or or you know or disengage in key parts of the customer journey. Um, I think codifying those processes in a tool like Sugar is great. Um, and then I think also using some, you know, like using tools like customer journey, you know, and other things inside of Sugar help drive training reduction and help orient the sales and the service people about what to do next, right? Because not everybody in the company probably has the perfect view of the customer journey. Um, it's constantly evolving and changing. And so, um, you know, just having a tool that allows you to define those things and then just incorporate them into the user experience and kind of guide um, your sales and service people, I think that's 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 a good um, approach to solving the poorly orchestrated handoff issue. So the the sales guy's job isn't over when the deal gets inked. It's over <laughs> when the commission hits, right? You tell me, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're you're. You're you're uh, you're absolutely right. Like I, I think you know, the best salespeople I know, they keep a pulse on their customers all the time, even when they're not having issues, even when they're not calling them, they're calling them and saying, hey, you know, how's it going, um, and just kind of staying on top of that. And I think they're also partnering well with their peers in the services organization to make sure that they know what's going on, and if there are issues that are popping up, that they're getting a hold, you know, they're getting a handle on them early. All right. Cool. Disjointed customer communication. This is a, you know, this is one that's really prevalent right now with the rise of omnichannel and chat and email. You know, five or ten years ago, um, phone for for like B two B, phone and email were the most dominant channels of communication with a company. Um, you know, be, uh, between a customer and a company. Nowadays, you have twelve or more channels that that companies can deploy. You know, from social to messaging to self service to all these types of things. And so, um, uh, you know, it's not uncommon for companies to deploy new channels, but then not be able to integrate them back into their tools. Mm -hmm. And so, conversations are happening in silos and other places. And and as as you'll see throughout this presentation, silos really are the enemy of good customer experience, right? So, how do you bring all that communication together into a single place so that everybody can understand the history and what's going on. Um, and I think that's, you know, there's a bunch of techniques to get there. Uh, you know, the most important one I'll say is, is don't have all the channels, pick the ones that are most relevant for your <laughs> customer base, just be good at those. Um, Cause I, you know, I think it's easy to be like, oh my gosh, we have to, you know, we have to handle all this stuff. You don't, you just have to pick the ones that are right for your customers, be really good at them, but then I'll, you know, bring all that, back together into a single place that both sales and service and marketing can have access to. Yeah, I kind of see that even in my personal life. I'll be having a text conversation and I'll be talking to the same person in an Instagram message and I'm like, what, what am I doing? <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I was reading that I think the average person has like 12 social media accounts or something. Like it's, <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> 
I can't even keep it all straight. So yeah. yeah. Um, third one is uh, silos. I mean, you know, again, um, we design companies to, you know, with, or, you know, we, we, we design our organizations inside of these companies to create proficiency in particular areas, right? Like sales or service. And we give the leadership of those parts of the business, we try to give them tools that help them execute their end of the customer experience uh, better. But what what's happened as a result of that is people get very hyper fixated on their piece of the pie and not looking at, you know, what's going to happen after sales or before sales or, or, you know, after service or before service. And so um, having a way to bring right sales and service people into a single place where you know where they can see kind of the same view of things helps eliminate a lot of those silos it it, cre it creates collaboration and context um and so yeah just you know as you're looking at your own business ask yourself the question where are the silos in my business everybody has them right it's not like this is a uh something to be ashamed of right it's just it's just right. natural um so yeah you know i i think you know look for those silos and look look for opportunities of where you can create collaboration yeah uh, brain so uh jim ward our ceo he always says you know we gotta make sure everybody's rowing in the same direction yeah so, it's a lot easier when you are yeah and the incentive needs to be for everybody to get to the same spot not you go that way you go this way <laughs> exactly exactly Oh man, this is a good one. So, you know, just kind of getting back to the silos topic about being a good sales leader versus, uh, you know, being a good customer experience leader or being a good service leader versus being a good customer experience leader. Um, it's not, it's not uncommon that, you know, when you start looking at your own organization from a customer experience perspective, you, you might realize that your departmental goals are at odds with your customer goals. And a great example of that is as a service a leader, you might be looking at average handle time as a metric, like, like how much time are my, you know, agents spending on the phone and after a call to like wrap up a case or a customer service issue. And, and naturally mm -hmm. you want to reduce that amount of time because then you can handle more uh, requests with fewer people. That sounds great. But the reality is, is that uh, if you, if you take that too far, you're going to create a bad customer experience where people don't feel like they're actually being heard, right? Shuffled off the phone. <laughs> they're getting shuffled off the phone, right? And 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 that's you know if you look at call center metrics and all that stuff, that's been happening in large swaths of you know of industry for years. So um, you really want to make sure that as you're designing your goals and your KPIs and your incentives, think of your CX KPIs as being the top of the pyramid. And then think of your departmental KPIs as being that next level down. Just make sure they're aligned and that they're working together. Yeah. Oh man, you know, this is also oh, a good one. A good one. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's been an explosion in awesome tools um, and systems. You know, I think, you know, the average mid-sized business probably has like 25 different tools and systems that you know that they're using to run their day-to-day -day operations how do you bring it all together um you know integration costs are always scary uh especially if they look custom or or you know or one off a lot of times you have to you know you have to wait you have to deal with somebody in IT who might not be you know they've got a ton of stuff on their plate and an integration project is a big project for uh, you know for them so i think looking at ways to bring the data together without having to uh, spend a lot of money on, you know, on, or, or time even. Um, I, it, there's, so, there's so many different ways to, uh, to do that and nowadays. I mean, you know, you know we have our own product, uh, Sugar Integrate, which is designed to connect all these systems to, uh, together, but there's, there's more than one way to skin a cat, right? I, you know, and I guess the, the point I'll make to everybody is, um, when you bring the data together and people actually get to see it all like uh, fitting together and how you know how one piece can affect another that drives change in the organization a lot faster than anything else right people mm -hmm. love to get their opinions about what they should do or why but when you really look at the data and say hey it's taking us this long to do this process because of these things 
all of a sudden it's very clear, you know, what you need to do to actually make a, you know, a make a better customer experience and, mm -hmm. and, and impact the bottom line. So don't if shy only, away from integration. If only there was a company out there that could help you with that. Yeah. <laughs> hmm. <Tell us. laughs> I, I'm pretty sure you all know a thing or two about integration. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's get to, you know, tips and best practices. How do you build an organization alignment around the customer experience? Yeah, this is, you know, if you look at where, like most companies will agree that they have customer experience issues and they want to make improvements, but they're not quite sure how to get started. So um, I like to take it in a couple layers. Um, I think there's a Venn diagram of, of, what, of what sales and service can do together. Right, and you definitely need to understand that, and that's what you know. That's what that's what we'll talk through on this slide. Um, but you also need to build a map for the whole organization, so they kind of understand how the customer moves through their own journey, and and you know where the points of of truth and value are in that process. And and you know we'll uh, you know we'll get into that in a couple slides. But um, you know if you sit back and you ask yourself a question, okay, what what is the overlap between sales and service, like what you know, what are the business functions or customer functions that overlap between those two teams? Um, here's the ones that come to mind, right? So things like identifying at-risk customers. Um, if you know you have a whole lot of information that comes into your service desk about customer health and happiness, um, how is that information making it back um, either to the sales team or into a central place where the whole company can look at it, right? Mm -hmm. That's 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 a one thing. Um, you know, another thing that we've seen with customers like Backcountry and you know and and some other you know some um, some other customers like that is they actually pivoted their service team from just being a pure like I have an issue I'm going to help you resolve it to being um, like kind of like product experts mm -hmm. and being able to recommend other products and services based on what they know about a customer. And so, you know, not coming across as a salesperson because no service person wants to be a salesperson. That's why they work in service, right? But what they do want to, you know, what they do like to do is help the customer and, and, um, and you know, maybe help them uncover value that they didn't know was there. And mm -hmm. so um, taking advantage of the relationships that your services team has built with, you know, with your customers and how they've helped them that can be a back channel for the sales team to, um, you know, either pursue either pursue new opportunities or upsell opportunities inside that account. I'll just talk mm -hmm. to a couple more. Um, uh, I mean, you know, there's some real basic ones like um, what happens if the customer is not paying their bill on time, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> you know, who 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 calls them? You know, what's the conversation like? Um, you know. A lot of times when customers are unhappy or not paying, it's because they're unhappy and they're unhappy with something that they've received, you know, either the product or the service. And so having that history of what they bought and how they're experiencing it and what issues they've run into along the way in a single place, absolutely critical. And, and you know, companies that don't have integrated sales and service, uh, you know, views they spend a lot of time pulling that together on a manual basis, and and the data is just never as current or as useful as you know as it could be if it was right there in front of people all you know all the time. Um, I think there's a couple of other things you know like um, uh, you, you know as you as you uncover um, friction points in your customer experience process or you know or or you know or your sales or service processes. Uh, I think you also have the opportunity to like take and automate key handoff points or key, you know, like, uh, you know, reminders or announcements based on information from both sides of the fence, right? So both sales and service information allow you to create more consistent messaging, more targeted messaging and things that are going to kind of allow the customer, you know, to, you know, to come away with the point of, oh, wow, they really understand me and they know what I'm going through. So, you know, just a couple of examples. I'm sure you guys have, you know, have more examples and thoughts here, but but right. you know, really about thinking about where those two overlap. Yeah, having a central view of the entire customer experience. You know, as a salesperson, you know, are you really going to make a call to your client if they've just put in like 18 tickets on your software and be like, "Hey, guess what else we got?" 
Right. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it should out. be a different call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I think I've had those calls too, where it's like, right. I'm like walking into a bear trap, right? And it's like, <laughs> oh no. Ex e yeah, exactly. Give, you know, give, give salespeople the information they need to have the, the right conversation, yeah. right? The same on the other side, you know, yeah. the service people need to know, you know, everything that the sales, that the customer has purchased. And Why did they buy the product? Exactly. <laughs> what is the purpose that they're trying to solve? You know, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how good we've become at operating without that context. Right. Imagine if you had it, right? <laughs> cool. So kind of tactically getting into how you untangle the customer experience uh, web, right? The first thing, the most important thing in my mind, um, and this is very grounding and it's, it's also a bit of an arts and crafts exercise, is building a map of your view of the customer experience. And there's, you know, there's, there's online tools, you know, you can work with brain cell. There's, there's a whole bunch of ways to do this. But you should have like a picture. It's like a you know an infographic almost that shows how the customer moves through your business and and where and where they get value. When people have that, it's amazing how quickly the departments come together and just fix things. Okay. All right. Um, so don't underestimate the importance of just taking the time to you know to go and figure this out. The next one, and we've talked about this on a couple of other slides, is just making sure your KPIs and goals are aligned between departments and customer experience. Like as as I've noticed at many companies, you know, going from a departmental orientation of I'm a sales manager or sales leader and I need to hit my sales KPIs of upsell and cross sell and retention and, and new business and all that stuff. Um, if those are at odds with the customer experience, it's just like you said, it's like you have one group uh, rowing one way in the boat and the other group rowing the other way. And what happens? You just go in circles, right? <laughs> so it's really critical to get this right. Um, and it's easy to get it right once you have the map too, right? Because you kind of know what's important to the customer, where, you know, where the, where the key like moments of truth are in that customer journey that say, ah, I picked the right vendor or I picked the right partner and, and, and I'm getting value. So. Definitely, you know, definitely get those aligned. Seamless handoffs is also another one, and this is, you know, this is big in the omni-channel world these days, right? Is, um, you know, people aren't just calling in; they're starting on your website, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I start everything with a Google search. You know, I'm like, okay, how do I do whatever? I, don't I do it myself, so I don't have to talk to anybody. <laughs> exactly. I type that into Google. Where does that take me? Right, do, you know, does that take me to your company website? Do, you know, does it take me to your self-service, uh, you know, help center? Um, you know, am I landing on a chat bot, right? How, how do I navigate that path and either, you know, get to a solution or get to a person that can get me to a solution? And um, I think I've seen more bad examples than good examples, you know, like the, the, the classic one I've seen is, is people will, you know, a company will stand up a help center and um, you know they'll have a nice little search bar at the top where you can type your question, um, and but you have to actually type your question before you can open a case, mm. right? Like most of the time, I know when my product's broken. I I don't think any help article is going to help me, but to have to go through extra steps to just open a case, you know, when I know something's broken, um, that's an example of of the company trying to create a good self service experience. But the but it not being aligned with customer expectations, and so you know again building these handoffs and kind of understanding how people flow through your business, it, it will be anchored by that journey map. Um, but I think it becomes very clear what tools and technologies and processes you'll need to have the right handoffs and and drive that you know good positive customer experience end to end. Um, this is an easy one. I mean, you know, this is, I've, I've been at Sugar for 12 years. Uh, I'm part of the furniture at this point. Um, and, you know, we kind of got started as just a traditional CRM tool. And, and people really, you know, the account record has always been the core 
of of the system, right? And and what's been interesting to me is in the last five years, uh, sales and service tools have split up. You know, you know, you have Zendesk, and then you have like you know, like or like you know, if you know, if if we take Salesforce as an example, they had Salesforce, which had everything, and then they split it up into Sales Cloud and Service Cloud, and Marketing Cloud, and all that stuff, right? So, um, so uh, that fragmentation of tools has created a fragmentation of customer information in a lot of cases as well. So, um, cr you know, creating a common place, you know, uh, whether it's the account record or dashboards or what have you, where people can come and look at the customer and understand the sales and the service uh, experience, I think that is absolutely critical. And that's really the linchpin of, you know, of a lot of these projects is just bringing all the data together into a single place. Yeah, I'm not that smart. I want to click on, you know, my customer and be able to remember what the last conversation was and what any other other person at the company talked to them about. So I'm not going totally. blind. I can't remember, you know, this customer versus the, the other one if it's six months later. I need to know. Oh yeah. Well, and I mean, especially if you think about the average salesperson is probably covering a hundred customers. Okay. or more sometimes and so they don't have the i mean I, I think you know most people can handle like three or four things you know tops right so so it's you know it's at some point you need a better filing system a better data tracking system that tells you what's important and that's i mean at the end of the day that's what we're trying to provide right mm -hmm. so and and i think that um you know that dovetails nicely into this next one you know which is you can't really have a single view of the customer without a common data platform, right? Um, if, you know, without it, your reporting is gonna be fragmented, your process management's gonna be fragmented. Um, you're gonna have a lot of uh, challenges trying to stitch a very consistent customer experience together if you don't have kind of common foundations. So, um, you know, looking at this strategically, you know, from a customer experience perspective, you should be asking yourself the question, where do I want to put all this information? Um, and how do I want to report on it? How do, how do I want to, you know, how do, how do I want to automate these things? And that's, um, that's one thing that we feel like we're very good at at Sugar, but, um, uh, you know, I think the, the, uh, the, uh, the opportunity for every company out there is to think about how they can take advantage of this common data platform to drive these uh, next level customer experiences. Very cool. And, and last but not least, so you know, uh, turn great customer service into revenue. I think, I think in in today's economy, people um, people trust other people, uh, especially you know other customers or you know third party. You know, like think about all the review sites and 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 all the places we go to develop our opinions um, and. Uh, you know, factual basis about the companies, you know, that that we do business with. Um, your customer service team is a part of your entire go to market motion. Mm -hmm. And um, they want to support those initiatives. They want to be part of the solution. They don't want to be seen as just a cost center. Um, that's not very fun. And I think that gets boring over time. Right. Everybody wants to feel like they're contributing to, uh, you know, to the to, to the success of of the company, and so um, the quality of that customer service experience has a very direct relationship to the um, to the chance that your customer is going to expand their services with you or even renew existing contracts, right? So, making sure that you can attribute some of that, you know, some of those activities to the customer service team. Making sure that there's a clear way for a customer service person to pass a lead or an opportunity, you know, back to the sales team in a way that they feel um, is going to serve the customer best. I think the, you know, these are just basic examples of how you can turn your customer, you know, how you can elevate your customer service team above just, uh, you know, a break fix type of requests, right? And and I think if you look at the companies that really dominate. Um, especially on the consumer side, like Apple and, and, you know, like, you know, some of the banks and stuff like that, that are good, not the bad ones. Uh, they've really taken a lot of time to think through, um, how the customer service experience is accretive to the, you know, to the, to, to the total customer value, um, and how it's going to drive, 
how it's ultimately going to drive loyalty, right? right. So, um, yeah, think about those things. All right, and All right. now Charles will do the demo for us. So, well, let's take a look. It's going to be very fun to watch. Let me just pull up my screen. So um, before I get into the live demo, I just want to flip through a couple things real quick to make sure that you all understand what's there, right? So um, Sugar Serve has the capability for things like a digital self-service. It's got an omni-channel agent desktop, you know, which I'll show you live in a second. Um, that's cool because it, because it integrates uh, calls and chats and uh, social into a single place um, and drives a very crisp inbound workflow. Um, we, you know, we also have centralized routing escalation and SLA management. So, if, you know, if you have an important customer that needs a quicker response um, or, or an at-risk customer that needs extra hand-holding, you can design those processes um, and actually take the processes that we've already built uh, and just extend them out of the box, right? Uh, uh, we also have a knowledge base that, you know, that powers not only um, agent-based knowledge, uh, you know, which is called assistant service, but it also can power your um, self-service experience, like in terms of uh, uh, product FAQs or technical bulletins. And there's an entire knowledge authoring process built into the tool. It supports multiple languages and things like that. So, um, you know, your ability to capture the best practices about how to serve your customers will reduce your training times and um, and also in, improve your overall level of service. Um, Sentiment and coaching is, is something that's fairly new. It just came out in the last uh, release. It requires Amazon Connect, but um, even without Amazon Connect, if you have another phone system or, or other tool that provides the sentiment information, that can be uh, pumped into Sugar in the same way. But the cool thing about this is you get to zoom in on all the conversations that your team is having across sales and service, understand where the friction points are, and um, I, you know, identify either coaching or customer experience improvement opportunities. Um, it, it, um, and then on the back of serve, uh, we also have a field service offering so that the, you know, so that the scope of service doesn't just end, um, at the help desk or at the call center, but extends all the way out to the people in the field, um, that, you know, might need to go on site and perform repairs or, uh, you know, or, or, you know, provide some type of on site service, like, a you know, uh, fire inspection or something like that. And so the you know the ability to schedule those technicians or those people that you know that are out in the field and what happens when you know when clients change or cancel appointments those are big friction points that uh, companies have operationally uh, today and and you know we can help you solve those as well um, and then last but not least is um, as a lot of companies are digitizing uh, especially with their you know with the service side of their business they might have a lot of pen and paper uh, processes time cards, um, you know, uh, work logs and things like that. It's really easy to digitize those in Sugar and just, uh, you know, integrate that whole process um, into a single uh, customer view and a, and, a, and a single pane of glass. So let's go look at the live demo and see how all this works. All right, so I'm just gonna give you guys a little bit of context here. I assume everybody can see my screen because I've been talking to it. Um, let's just pretend that we're a toy company and this is our website. Um, if I, you know, if I'm a customer or a prospect, I can use, uh, this chat bug on the, on the front of the website to, uh, get in touch with somebody. I'm just going to select myself just so that we can fix the routing here. This is just for, this is just for demo purposes. So, um, you know, I could ask a question, say, hello, I have a product question. And as soon as I do that, I'm getting a call here in my um, Sugar Live console, right? So I'm just going to answer that call. And, or it's, it's, it's actually a chat, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just going to answer the chat. And uh, you can see that I have the chat, uh, you know, I have the question from the chat. Um, coming through, and I can respond to the customer. Yes. Hello. Who am I speaking with? Right. And you'll see that comes through on 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 the website. My name is Charles. And from here, I can start to look up this 
uh, person, right? So I, I can, you know, I can simply type in the name, uh, you know, uh, Charles here. I can see that it's uh, Charles Hicks. And, you know, without even leaving the screen, I can pull up uh, Charles's contact profile. I can see which cases are open, right? I can see my entire timeline of conversations with with uh, Charles, right? So if he's worked with a salesperson or if he's called in previously, um, all that information is in one very easy to read place. And then if there's a question that that he has that I might not have an answer to, I can type it into the knowledge base, right? So I can be like reset password. And here I have access to a knowledge base articles that can help me um, you know, address the question very quickly and easily, right? So this is this is Sugar Live. This is part of uh, Sugar Serve. It's included. Uh, there's no additional cost for the interface. Um, there is costs for you know things like the chat and the and the phone uh, usage. Obviously, that's you know that's all done through Amazon uh, Connect. Um, you know, but you know, but uh, but but there are also um, other phone and phone and chat options that can integrate with this as well. So. Uh, you know, just kind of continuing through this flow, um, I can, you know, I can do a couple of other interesting things too. So if, if I need to go look up additional information that isn't in the screen, I can simply, uh, I can simply minimize uh, Sugar Live and I have access to the full CRM, right? So, so, you know, I, I might want to go look at the account in more detail or run a report, um, you know, but if I ever need to come back to uh, to the chat, I just click at the bottom, and it's you know and it's right back there. Um, additionally, if you know if I need to log a new case, I can simply do that here, and you know the uh, context is copied over. Question. Um, you know things like the the uh, contact name and the account are all pre-populated, and then I can focus in on that case, right? So, you know, as I click on the case on the agent desktop, it then changes the tab from the contact tab to the case tab. And here I have the full case details. Again, I have the knowledge base. I've got internal comments. Um, it, you know, I have the case timeline. And the nice thing about this is all of these screens are configurable. So, uh, you know, if I don't want the knowledge base or the comment log, if I want past purchases or upcoming contracts, I can add those as dashlets here as well. So lots of uh, flexibility and configuration there um a couple other kind of brief points and then i know we're going to be short on time and and we'll pop back to the q a um, um as i wrap up this chat um it's going to do so sugar live is going to do a couple of really interesting things so um as i close the chat it's going to actually log all, the entire interaction um, automatically as a message or as a phone call, and it will transcribe it for you, right? So, you know, so I've got the full transcription there. Um, for calls, we have the ability to uh, to grab and surface the sentiment score, um, which I think you saw earlier. And and so the nice thing about the sentiment scores is not only do they identify high points and low points in the call you can aggregate those scores across many 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 kind of interactions and start to pull metrics and analytics on the types of questions customers have and how they feel about them or or you know what you know what the emotional tone of those um issues is like and and i think this is important because in the customer service world a lot of the times the only way that we can get quantitative feedback is through surveys Right, and surveys are great, but not everybody wants to take the time to fill them out. And so, being able to leverage uh, sentiment and transcription and things like this are ways for us to get a view of, uh, you know, high points and low points in the customer experience without asking the direct question. Right. So it's just, it's it's just another tool in your tool belt. Um, yeah. So, um, in you know, in addition to uh, uh, Sugar Live and the Service Console. Um, you know, you have a bunch of other things built into Serve. There's about 65 uh, business processes that ship with Serve. That, you know, that are designed to reduce your your implementation time. Um, there's about 120 reports that you know that cover all aspects of customer service, from you know top issues by channel, top issues by category. Um, you know, uh, how busy the teams are. You know, uh, based on caseload and things like that. 
what's you know what's the average response time average handle time all of those metrics are built in um as is the extensible knowledge base there's also a customer portal um and and a whole bunch of other cool stuff so uh you know i would definitely encourage you to take a look at uh, at uh, sugar serve uh, deeper i've been working on it probably for the last two and a half years at sugar I think you know we're we're very proud of how it's evolved and 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 how it's um, solving real customer needs, it, it, you know especially in the B two B and in, in um, and in the B two C call center space. So I'm just going to end the demo there and <clears throat> hand it back to you guys. I think I think it's time for questions. Yeah, cool. So I'm just going to ask a couple questions first. Um, yeah. So does serve work with all versions of sugar? No, it's um, so serve has a couple of restrictions. So it's cloud only, um, and you need cell, right? So it's like uh, you have to have cell to have serve. Um, you can upgrade from enterprise to cell and serve at the same time, um, and you know there's there's always a little you know there's always a few things that you need to consider in that upgrade process, but but um, you know, from from our perspective, we've tried to make it as seamless as possible. Um, serve and sell are built on top of the enterprise code base, so they're it's this they're they're the same um, it's the same underlying code base that that powers enterprise. It's the same underlying cloud that powers enterprise. It's just more functionality on top of it. So there's no like big logistical moves or anything if you're already in the cloud. Um, it's really just turning on the licensing and then and then you know making some tweaks to your processes and your and and your user license assignments. Gotcha. And how much how much does this cost? Oh, great question. Serve is um and and you know the pricing is always on our website, but serve is eighty dollars per uh, eighty dollars per user per month list. I'm sure our friends at BrainCell can get you guys a screaming you know screaming deal on that. So. And then uh, typically, uh, how long does it take to get uh, sugar up and running, sugar serve up and running? Um, and what's that process look like if you were going to say, go from pro to sell and serve or even enterprise to? Yeah. So uh, I think, it, you know, it could be as short as a couple of weeks. Um, the big steps are if you're upgrading from pro or upgrading from enterprise, um, you just need to make sure like your legacy workflows and stuff like that can get mapped over to the new BPM framework. Um, and, uh, and then I would suggest most customers start with email to case. So, you know, they basically turn on serve, they point it at a customer service mailbox, like support at brain cell or, or, you know, what, or, you know, what, uh, whatever your a domain is and then um that will automatically ingest emails from that mailbox it will assign them to your support team based on the rules that you that you define in the bpms um and it will also set the slas on when those cases should be resolved and followed up on and all that stuff so you you get all that for free um all you got to do is is basically is start by pointing it at your support mailbox um for for you know business to business companies there's still a, i'd say you know it's still probably between 40 and 60 percent of your communications with your customers in a service context or through email so i think starting there is a really uh, really easy really low friction way to get started and, and start to see the value of serve and then um from you know from there i would connect your phone system i would connect your your a website chat i would start looking into self-service um you know those are the types of of steps you know steps i would take and recommend to just kind of get started quickly but then also start to take advantage of the rest of the serve platform right cool now uh caitlin i don't know if uh do we have any other questions from the audience we answered all of them uh, i guess not <laughs> oh nope sorry i was on oh. mute we have one um, how do you go about meeting um, compliance? Any requirements? Uh, great question. What kind of compliance, I guess? You know, I think um, uh, there are, there's a whole mess of compliance frameworks out there, depending on what type of business that you're in. 
um, you know, we're not going to be compliant with things like PCI and, you know, uh, probably deep uh, financial compliance frameworks, right? So you're, you know, you, you're going to need to work with your team at BrainCell to understand those, you know, those compliance challenges and how they map back to sugar. Um, you know, I think uh, we are compliant with a lot of the major, you know, like like SAS 70 and those types of frameworks and stuff like that. So, so it's, you know, not to say that we don't do compliant uh, deployments at, at, um, at all, but there's always a limit to how, you know, to how far you can go in certain compliant situations. And there's also techniques and strategies to make, uh, the sugar environment compatible with those types of frameworks, right? I mean, you know, we have customers in government and uh, federal and state and local. Um, you know, I have uh, huge banking clients, right? And and they're all, you know, they're they're all using Serve in you know in the cloud in some capacity. So uh, lots of ways to get there. I think we just need to know what the, you know, right. I think a lot of people also misunderstand the compliance thing when you talk about a software they have the capability of being compliant. You know, it's got to be turned on and off and you got to set it up right. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's it's not going to be say, that's, actually, that's that's a better description of the morass of compliance, right? It, it's not like is it a yes or no? It's just like, oh, well, what do we need to do to make it compliant? Right. And and um, you know, we we try to make that as easy as possible. Um, but if you guys are having friction, please, you know, please let us know. All right. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, thanks, Charles, for participating. It was great to have you on. I think we all learned a lot. Um, as a reminder, we're going to be sharing the recording and the slide deck. Uh, it'll probably hit your inboxes tomorrow morning. Um, we're also offering a complimentary audit of your customer experience uh, process to all the attendees. And we'll kind of review your business goals and objectives and conduct an efficiency assessment of your tech stack um, so that we can make recommendations for improvements um, so you can reach your goals. So if you're interested in taking advantage of that, uh, send an email to growth at braincell.net or talk to your customer success manager if you know them. Um, have a great rest of the week uh, and goodbye. Thanks. Thanks, everybody.